Hi, everyone. Glad to have you here with us today. We're just uh, getting started here with this webinar of uh, an online screening of a film, which we're very excited about. Abby Martin's Gaza Fights for Freedom. Uh, followed by a Q&A with Abby Martin and some uh, input from our friend in Gaza, Riyad uh, Shakshak, uh, of We Are Not Numbers. We're just waiting now for uh, confirmation of attendance. Okay, I'm seeing attendees coming in. That's great. Um, while we're waiting for everyone to connect, I'd like to invite you all to have a look at the most recent statement by uh, uh, those who are online, the most recent statement by the Freedom Flotilla, where we indicate that we're, um, we're not sailing uh, as planned in the month of May. Obviously, nobody is up for traveling at this time. There's international restrictions on travel. Uh, as well as on public gatherings, which is what we do when we sail uh, towards Gaza and the voyage beforehand. Uh, so that message outlines why we're not doing that. Uh, but it also uh, stresses the importance of solidarity with Gaza at this time. Um, Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinians in general, but Palestinians in Gaza in particular, are um, very vulnerable to, um, to COVID-19. Uh, they're more vulnerable. All of us are somewhat vulnerable where we live, but they're more vulnerable than the rest of us due to the crowded conditions, due to the lack of health infrastructure, and of course, due to the blockade, which is what the Freedom Flotilla is all about. Um, so have a look there at our message. We do plan to sail. We have uh, our campaign companions. We've just sort of pressed pause for the moment uh, while we uh, concentrate on what we can do at a distance online as solidarity for um, Gaza. Um, a lot of folks are wondering about what to do um, in terms of Gaza solidarity, uh, while we're all locked down wherever we are, uh, we would like to people to consider donating through UNRWA. Uh, I put a link there. Uh, the United Nations Relief Work uh, Agency is, um, for a long time, has been the main uh, institutional support to Palestinians, uh, Palestinian refugees, uh, and Palestinians in Gaza in particular, and they have uh, an appeal there about COVID-19, a matching donation. There are obviously other organizations you can donate to, but that is one that we feel is reputable and important and gets supplies in where they, um, where they matter. Uh, another organization to consider supporting uh, is We Are Not Numbers. Um, our partner who we'll be hearing about, af hearing from after the film, so Raya Chakshak will be joining us after the film uh, to uh, do some discussion. Um, they are a group of uh, aspiring and inspiring young um, journalists in Gaza, uh, Palestinian youth, uh, young people who are telling their own stories um, beyond the statistics, beyond the numbers uh, about daily life in Gaza. They've been doing it for a while, uh, but we, um, we encourage people to support them and their work. And I'm having trouble copying that link, so I'll copy it in a while and keep getting the UNRWA link. Um, and sorry, I copied that link to the wrong place. Just a moment. Let me copy it here. So the UNRWA link for all of you is there. Um, and the uh, update from the Freedom Flotilla is there. Um, we also wanted to uh, talk to you about um, We Are Not Numbers, uh, so wearenotnumbers.org. They will be coming on a little bit later, uh, as I said, to give us an update from Gaza, a reaction to the film after we've all seen it, but also an update from Gaza uh, about the conditions there right now. Um, so we would encourage you to stick around and listen to Rai Chakshak from Gaza uh, from We Are Not Numbers. Donate if you can through UNRWA or through another humanitarian organization to deal with the current conditions of the blockade. Uh, and then also consider, uh, if, you've enjoyed, if you enjoy the film, uh, consider afterwards visiting uh, the film site uh, and ordering it either for yourself for a short-term rental or ordering a copy that you can view anytime. Um, we're now at almost 200 participants. There were just over 400 registrants, so I'll wait just a little bit longer before we start uh, viewing the film. Um, so our program for today will be very shortly, we'll sh start streaming the film. Um, after that, we will um, go to a Q&A with Abby uh, Martin, the filmmaker, who will join us uh, live from California for a Q&A. Uh, as that ends, we will hook, uh, hook into uh, Gaza and talk to Ray Chakshak of um, We Are Not Numbers about his perspective. Uh, and we'll be providing you with some information throughout about uh, where and how you can help support Gaza uh, and where and how you can um, 
learn more about our campaigns and about our uh, organizations. Uh, your sponsors today include, I'm speaking to you, David Heap from London, Ontario, speaking to you about uh, from Canadian Boat to Gaza, part of the Freedom Flotilla Coalition. Um, uh, we were also sponsored by the people who pulled this together. It was originally supposed to be a local film screening here in London with the uh, Social Justice Event Collective, who you can see there in London, Ontario, Canada, uh, who was thinking of it as a, something that we often do in Israeli Apartheid Week in March, a public film screening at the library in London. But of course the library, like all other public venues, is shut down and has been for a while. So we've transitioned to this uh, mode of delivery uh, with the Canadian Boat to Gaza, the Freedom Flotilla, also IJV London, Independent Jewish Voices London, co-sponsoring along with the Social Justice Event uh, Collective. Um, we're just about to hit 200, so if everything's in place, I think we can go to the film shortly. Um, I just want to let you know that there will be a Q&A afterwards. If you're typing in the, uh, if you're trying to type in the chat, that's not going to work. So uh, you should see a Q&R uh, button at the bottom. Um, and uh, to support the movie, um, I think I put the link there for... Uh, a couple minutes ago for Vimeo.order on demand, sorry, Vimeo.com on demand Gaza Fights, uh, where you can organize, where you can rent it or download it uh, for yourself. Uh, the film itself is at GazaFightsForFreedom.com, uh, um, which uh, shows a great trailer and some information about organizing um, community screenings, which is also a way to support the film. And I'm sure we'll hear about the exciting story of creating the film. Uh, from uh, Abby when she comes on a little bit later. Um, okay, the Q and A comes up when uh, the Q and A comes up when a question is there, and then it goes away. You can always click on the um, uh, close the Q and A uh, and have it go away, and you'll see. Right now, you see four screens. In a minute, you will see uh, the just the video screen. So the program looks like this. The film is about an hour 25 or 30 minutes long, so count on an hour and a half from when we start. Uh, so we're going to start at about 10 after. Uh, after that, we'll have Abby for a while talking about her experience creating the film, uh, how she had to collaborate with uh, filmmakers, uh, journalists in Gaza in order to create it, um, things like that. And then we will get a reaction from, from Gaza, from Riot of uh, We Are Not Numbers in Gaza. Um, we'll close with more information for all of you. Um, I'm seeing another question, so I'll just pop that open right now. Um, so the program in all, uh, we, we've budgeted three hours here, um, but we don't need to use those three hours. Uh, the main, the film will be about an hour and a half, followed by the discussion, um, uh, and we should all be done before three uh, Eastern time. Sorry, before four Eastern time, yeah. Um, so between two and three hours in all. Um, can you all see the links there that I've put up, uh, Vimeo on Command, etc.? cetera? Um, okay, I think we're ready to go to the film, Jace, if that's possible. أول شابة مسعفة ميدانية متطوعة كانت هي أول شابة كشابة يعني كفتاة تنزل على المخيمات العودة والكل شيء بادر فيها وشارك فيها أنا كمان شاركت كل البيت شارك زوجي وأولاد وجيراني وإخواني كل العالم يعني كل الفلسطينيين شاركوا هي مش أكتر هي صح رايحة وبعدين مسيرتنا مسيرة سلمية ما إحنا حاملين سلاح ولا إشي بالعكس إحنا بصدورنا العارية أمام قوة كبيرة من الجيش اللي هي مدرعاتهم وأسلحتهم وغازهم وطائراتهم إحنا مسيرتنا سلمية بنطالب بحقنا من حق يكون أنا إلي بلد من حق يكون لي بيت من حق اللي متشردين في البلاء في كل مكان هذول النزعين يجوا على بيوتهم مقال الأوام ما كلهم قاعدين في العالم كله قاعدين وبتفرجوا علينا كل واحد مرتاح إحنا عنا حصار لا معابر شغالة ولا دنيا وين بدهم يروحوا Well, that was a powerful film. 
Uh, thank you all um, for sticking with us. Uh, we're just over 220 uh, uh, participants uh, viewing this live. Uh, just as a reminder, we are uh, very happy to bring you this film today by special arrangement with Abby, Abby Martin, uh, who will be joining us in a moment. Um, I would just like to point out that you, this is this recording is for you, the people who registered for free to do this, uh, but it will not be in its entirety, obviously, uh, streamed to YouTube. Um, or archived afterwards. We will be archiving the part that is this, uh, the Q&A, the panel discussion, but only a trailer of the film, because obviously uh, to have your own copy of the film, we want you to go to the link that has just been shared, um, vimeo.com slash on demand slash Gaza fights. Uh, we encourage you to download it. Um, some of you have pointed out in your comments that the, uh, the video quality is variable. Obviously that's beyond our control. Um, a lot of people using the internet these days. Uh, one of our video people uh, just pointed out that Netflix has throttled their own bandwidth just because there's so much usage out there. We're not the only people running webinars. I think every organization in the world and their sibling now is doing webinars uh, for work or for activism or for other purposes as we're doing. So there's a lot of usage. Your video quality may have suffered. We're sorry about that, but we are happy to bring you this screening for free. However, uh, we really need you to go to um, the film website, or rather Vimeo, and download the film for yourself. You can rent it for 72 hours, but you're still going to have throttling issues or internet quality issues. If you download your own copy, you can view it as many times as you want, On obviously without being at the mercy of the internet. Um, we're happy to go to a Q&A shortly with um, Abby Martin, the journalist whose voice you heard throughout that film, uh, the creator of that film. Abby is a visual artist and an anti-imperialist journalist. Uh, she's the host of Media Roots, uh, sorry, Media Roots Radio and the creator of The Empire Files, uh, which you can find obviously online as well, and director of the documentary we've just heard. Um, hopefully she'll be here to answer questions about her uh, video in a moment. Um, uh, so I know that you're queuing up your questions now. Uh, please go to the Q&A um, section in the middle of the bottom of your screens if you're still with us um, uh, to do that and Abby will be here in a minute to answer your questions. Um, hey David, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. It, it says that you stopped my video. I'm trying to start that, it again. That would be our, uh, with a Canada Boat Gaza. Oh, okay, okay, uh, great. Uh, I mean, okay, yeah. great. Yay. Thank you for joining us. Yay, thank you so much for having me. Did you hear the introduction? I did, yeah, it was great. I can't tell what people are seeing. So <laughs> a different uh, sort of venue. We were, as as you know, planning to screen this uh, live in, a, in right. a library in London, Ontario, but the venue, live venues are closed down, so we've gone to of online, course. which is great that we've got over 200 people online watching this with us. Uh, an right. amazing experience for all of us, and we're really happy you were able to join us. So without further ado, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your experience uh, creating the film. Um, and uh, since then, in the screenings that you did when you were able to tour. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you for hosting this. Thank you to all the organizations who feel the priority to, to highlight Gaza right now during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's really important to keep our brothers and sisters in Gaza in mind because it's obvious, right? I mean, you can't run ventilators without electricity the already devastating shortage of medical equipment um, and mobility in the region is just going to make the pandemic that much worse. The film all came together, uh, it started a couple of years ago when my partner, Mike Preisner, who does Empire Files with me, we were in the occupied West Bank. And we've done a series of reports that people can check out on the empirefiles.tv or our YouTube channel for free, uh, just about several you know, things about the occupation there. We tried to get into Gaza. Uh, we had all the correct paperwork, we had all the proper credentials, and I was told by Netanyahu's office uh, that I was a propagandist, and I was banned for life from entering Gaza. Not only that, but I was charged with being an Iranian agent, which was surprising to me because I'm, I'm used to being called a Russian agent and or a Venezuelan agent from my, <laughs> my association with RT and Telosaur. So that came out of the blue. It was pretty scary, actually, to be, be called that within... 48. Uh, so fast forward a couple years later, of course, the Great March of Return had sparked off and I was just absolutely abhorred by the corporate media coverage. You all saw how disgusting it is and was um, just cynical, uh, dehumanizing. 
uh, just atrocious, right? And this is something that was unprecedented in, in society. I mean, all stripes of Palestinians in Gaza, all ages, going out there in the tens of thousands uh, with flags, bared chests, and just getting mowed down by Israeli snipers. I mean, in the most egregious massacre in modern history, and it was being completely obfuscated and completely ignored by the corporate media. So I actually Skyped into a session with uh, about a dozen journalists within Gaza to talk about the corporate media coverage, to discuss how we can collaborate on an Empire Files episode or episodes about the Great March and do the story justice and amplify those voices that were not being heard uh, by Western audiences. And what came out of that collaboration was directing the interviews, getting these interviews on the ground, working with producers there. But once we saw the footage, uh, David, I, I was so blown away by the cinematic brilliance of what Asma Tia Hamad and Maz Mwaza did. I mean, not only did these people risk their lives running toward bullets and unmatched heroism and courage that I don't think I've ever seen, uh, certainly never worked with anyone who has been that brave, um, but, but just the incredible poetic nature of what they captured and just average day-to-day -day life of what Gazans lived through. And we knew then when we saw the footage and, and the slow motion, that, that 4K, uh, just, you know, just absolutely beautiful, kind of akin to Samsara and Baraka, if anyone's seen those movies. And we knew that we had to take a step back and really spend the better part of a year to put together a full feature length film. Um, one other comment I, I should make is that Razan's mother, who I think is the hero of the film, she was wary. I mean, she was rightfully worried about working with us. She had already been slandered and smeared in the corporate media. Uh, whenever there would be uh, Western media stories about Razan, they always kind of gave carte blanche to Israeli generals to explain away why she had to die why it was just an accident, right? So she was very distrusting. She didn't want to do the interview. Um, and so we made an arrangement with her that she would be the first one to see the film. <laughs> and if she liked it, we would move forward. And uh, thankfully she really loved the film. One other comment um, is you, might have, you may have noticed that we had to redact our producer's name at the end of the film. This was a gentleman that we worked with every single day on the ground, getting the, getting the footage together, field producing, once the film came out, he said he did not want to attach his name to it because of fear of retaliation from the Israeli government. And he was scared that he would never be able to leave Gaza if they knew that he was associated with the film. And I really think that shows you the stakes. It shows you what these people are dealing with. And um, when we took this film across North America, it was widely received, uh, incredibly so. Um, sold out theaters, audiences that were extremely receptive to the information. And I think it really is a testament to how much the movement, how much organizations like these, the people watching this film right now, how much we have pushed this issue into mainstream discourse, how much we have pushed the dialogue to the left, um, made it. So you cannot call yourself progressive, you cannot call yourself liberal unless you support a free Palestine and true liberation for the Palestinian people. And I'm really happy that this movie and the documentary and what we've collaborated with the Gazan journalists have just pushed that needle a little bit more, pushed the conversation a little bit more, which is why we structured the entire thing around international law to make really an incontrovertible case, just a clear cut case that you could take to anyone who's new to the issue. And there's no arguing. There's no arguing the fact that Israel is violating human rights, uh, committing several war crimes, um, just flagrantly, brazenly, and in direct violation of just every single you know, treaty, uh, the list goes on and on. So I think that um, this is a tool that we can all use in our movements. And thank you again. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Great, thank you, Abby. We've been getting, as you can imagine, lots of questions. Um, one of them concerns the lawsuit that you're, you're involved in for people who want to violate your free speech rights and prevent speaking across the U.S. Um, uh, about this film. Could you tell us, uh, give us an update on that or some background and an update on what's going on there? Absolutely, I'm really happy you brought that up. This is, uh, you know, <laughs> this is this is an issue that may be surprising to some, may not be considering the uh, kind of the pull that Israel has over our legislatures. 
But there are 28 states in the U.S. that have uh, preemptively passed anti-BDS legislation that essentially makes Americans forfeit their constitutional rights to free speech and their constitutional right to peacefully participate in political boycotts. This is a right that has been uh, given to us, you know, all the way back to the Montgomery bus boycott, the Supreme Court told us that, that this was a constitutionally protected right. Um, we know how effective boycotts have been around the world to hold uh, government's account, to force political accountability everywhere from South Africa, of course, to the civil rights movement here. Um, and that's why BDS is so crucial and so essential to galvanize around and be a part of the BDS movement. Of course, Israel is terrified of the BDS movement. That's why they have worked very, very hard to pass these laws in the US. And I'm not saying that lightly. Netanyahu's own office have tr has tweeted uh, that, that they have been proud to work very hard to get these bills passed. Uh, uh, foreign interference much? I mean, here we are being, <laughs> you know, being told by the corporate media day after day that Russia is interfering in our democratic processes. It seems like Israel um, has a lot to <laughs> account for that as well. So needless to say, one of these 28 states is the state of Georgia. I was scheduled to give a keynote speech at a media literacy conference at Georgia Southern University. This actually had nothing to do with the Gaza Fights for Freedom film. I, of course, maybe would have mentioned Palestine in my speech, but it certainly wasn't the topic of the speech. So I honestly um, had no idea that I would fall into this independent contractor clause and be given this contract myself, which basically, and this, this differs from state to state, but what I was given was a contract that if you are making an honorarium and you are a scheduled speaker at a university, and this is for independent contractors who are hurricane relief workers, who are construction workers, who are speech pathologists, who are substitute teachers, it doesn't just stop and start with, with you know, college campus speakers. This is everyone who falls into that independent contractor spectrum anywhere. And I was given the contract that said, uh, you must not boycott the state of Israel and you have to basically attest that you have never boycotted the state of Israel. Now, now this is my entire professional career, right? I've been, <laughs> I've been advocating the boycott of Israel for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. If I were to have signed this, it, it is ludicrous to actually expect people to sign a contract, basically retroactively erasing their body of work. I mean, what, what did they expect me to do? Erase my film, delete all the, all the interviews that I've ever done advocating this issue. It's absolutely absurd on its face. Of course, I mean, as someone who's deeply passionate about, about human rights and anti-racist issues, of course, I would never sign such a thing. It was deeply offensive to be given such a thing. And I was absolutely shocked that um, I was actually asked to, to, to do this, right? And so I decided to uh, go public with the story. I linked up with CARE and um, the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund, two amazing activist organizations on the front lines of fighting for civil rights. And uh, we moved forward with filing a lawsuit against the state of Georgia. And we're challenging that law now. I mean, it has been done in the past. These laws have been knocked down in several states. I think federal, I think um, state judges know. I mean, they understand what the constitution is. And even though these state legislatures are passing these laws, they know um, that the Constitution protects boycotts and also this is a free speech issue, first and foremost. And it is kind of ironic that it happened at what we're told are the bastions of free speech nationwide, as this hyperbolic notion of conservatives being censored, really what is being censored are Palestinian rights and the BDS movement on the campus issue, on the campus level. We see that with the anti-Semitic executive order that Trump passed trying to conflate anti-Semitism with BDS activism. This is the crux of the civil rights movement today. And I just hope that I can be a vehicle, that I can use my case and my voice as a tool to inspire others to uh, not forfeit their constitutional rights, simply to work in a state, to, to reject these contracts uh, and, and to expose them for what they are. Because we need to do this across the U.S. And it has to be done in the courts, state by state, case by case, and I just hope I can inspire others to do, this, do the same, and um, we're really optimistic that we can overturn this law. Fantastic, I appreciate it. Uh, for, Canadian, for Canadian viewers, we in Ontario are facing the IHRA, uh, so-called working definition of anti-Semitism and its nefarious uh, examples. 
uh, right now in the Ontario legislature before they broke for the COVID virus. Uh, and elsewhere in Canada, it's been blocked at a number of municipalities, but it's still uh, very much a live issue uh, in the Ontario legislature. So this kind of uh, stifling order, gag order, could hit Canadian institutions as well. And we also need to be prepared to fight it, as Abby said. Great. Uh, we have uh, tons of great questions here. I'm going to try to group them together and ask you and so qu uh, ask quickly. Um, the mass media avoids uh, uh, reporting on Gaza seriously, earnestly. How long have you been doing it? What pushed you to do it? Uh, you see your whole your whole working career. What got you into this story? Sure, thank you for asking that. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting, and I think Canadians can relate to this as well. It's kind of this indoctrination process, maybe not as severe in, in Canada, but, but really, as Americans, we are born thinking of Israel as essentially, you know, another state of the U.S. I mean, it's something that it's part and parcel with American democracy. Um, and we're told that this state must be protected at all costs. As someone who kind of become, became politically radicalized in the 9-11 era, 9-11 um, was a radicalizing moment for me. Palestine, Palestine of course, was predominantly blamed. Um, there was uh, propaganda footage of Palestinians, you know, all around the day of 9-11 and after, and you had neoconservatives on TV saying, we need to invade Palestine, let's take it over once and for all. So really the conflation of Palestinians as terrorists in the global war on terror has always been a constant. And so it was always in the back of my mind that, that Palestine was obviously an issue that was the crux of a lot, especially the basis of this disinformation campaign that was used to expand uh, bombing and, and you know, dehumanization against Muslims worldwide. And I think just several, you know, this is the issue about Palestine is that I think that everyone kind of knows broadly about it and, it and they think it's the most complicated issue in the world, right? And that's what we're told. Oh, it's such a complicated issue. They've been fighting over there for thousands of years. It's actually one of the most simple issues in the world. It's occupied, occupier, oppressed, oppressor. It's a settler colonial state that's uh, committing ongoing ethnic cleansing on a day-to-day -day basis as they expand their territory. Um, a country that was built on top of, of another one. Um, and that continued expansion it needs to be exposed. Uh, I think that when people understand this issue, several things in the media, you know, whether it's Israel committing a massacre, whether it's a bombardment of Gaza, whether it's the 20, uh, whether it's cast lead, whether it's Operation uh, Protective Veg, where 2,200 Palestinians were killed, 500 children, I think the every time Israel goes on the offense, people become awakened more. People say, wait, what is this really about? Maybe I do want to learn this. And so it's kind of always something that's in the back of your mind. And especially when you're involved in political activism, um, you know that, you know, you have to kind of get involved in, in Palestine liberation. But I think the crux of it for me, I think was the flotilla. Um, I think the flotilla massacre really opened my eyes about how the corporate media was covering for Israel um, just in an unabated fashion. Of course, uh, we all know what happened. Um, what was it? Nine, nine people massacred uh, on the boat by Israeli mercenaries in international waters. And, and I'll never forget the media coverage of that event where they were circling people on the boat who simply were trying to ward off these mercenaries with, with tables, you know, and silverware. And they were saying, here are the weapons that, you know, here, here's basically why um, Israel was justified in killing <laughs> peaceful people peaceful activists that were simply delivering aid and food to Gaza. And I just could not wrap my mind around that propaganda. And so I just, uh, you know, and, and especially working in media, knowing a lot of Palestinians, getting involved in activism, knowing a lot of Palestinians, and having to check in with them every single time Israel was bombing Gaza, that if their relatives were alive or not, that if, if they could get a hold of people, their friends and family and colleagues in Gaza. And that, that's something that never leaves you. As an internationalist, as someone who um, feels like, you know, our borders don't stop and start with the confines of our own countries, that hits home and that hits really hard. And that's something that, that um, you have to get involved in if you care about truth and social justice and um, anti-racism. Absolutely. Um, 
So uh, people are asking tons of great questions. We're going to have to pass some of them on to you later. We're not going to get a chance to answer them all. Um, but about the footage of the Israeli sniper, the video that there, and also in general, do you see ways of, do you have hope about ways of reaching people in Israel or reaching Israelis with this message? Obviously, this is a very powerful, powerful film. A couple of people messaged, messaged us that they had to leave. You've probably experienced that in public screenings so that people can't. Right. <laughs> They, 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 they can't they have to leave the room. This is extremely powerful footage, as you say, cinematographically powerful, but also just powerful in the human images. Um, how do you, do you get some of that? But also, uh, how do, uh, do you see a chance of reaching um, Israelis, uh, everyday Israelis, with, uh, with your message? Sure. Um, I, amazingly, you know, a lot of people have asked us, how do we get the footage of the Israeli sniper? This may surprise people, may not surprise people that, um, the Israeli military uh, members were actually sharing amongst themselves in a Facebook group chat videos of them massacring Palestinians at the border. And as you saw, kind of gleefully, sadistically laughing um, and being excited about it as if it were target practice. This is something that was not an anomaly. This is not just a bad apple. We're talking about a systematic practice that is based on the subjugation and dehumanization of another people. And that's the basis of Israeli society. Um, that's why I, I, I absolutely think there are great Israelis. I'm, I'm in contact with a lot of them, you know, Nico Piled, Ronnie Barkin. I'm in contact with a lot of anti-Zionist Israelis who are trying to put on Gaza Fights for Freedom in Tel Aviv. I don't know how well that will go, <laughs> but what the truth is, and this is what we tried to show in the polls, right, at the end of the film, that the majority of Israelis and the majority of uh, Israeli society agrees with these practices. Um, I was there on the ground. I did Man on the Streets. This was something that you can check out on Empire Files on our YouTube. And it, there's genocidal bloodlust kind of running through Israeli society. And I think in a way that we cannot expect change from within anymore. In fact, Israeli society is becoming increasingly fascistic, increasingly right-wing, increasingly racist. If there was a chance for a peace process or you know, a two-state solution back during the Oslo Accords, that chance has been dead for quite a long time. And you see so-called opposition party led by Benny Gantz, who is also an, a war criminal, um, who has bombed civilian neighborhoods. He was essentially trump light. I, I mean, it's a farce. It's a farce that there's any sort of left in Israeli society. I mean, being left is actually a slur in Israeli society. My colleagues Dan Cohen um, and David Sheen have been jumped, um, have been beaten up for simply filming giant kind of fascist uh, rallies where they're chanting not only death to Muslims, but death to the leftists, death to the videographers, because they hate Bet Salem. That Salem has to live in fear. I mean, they're threatened every day by the extremist settlers. And this is not just the extremist settlers. This is the mainstream Israeli society. And I encourage people to look at these man on the street interviews that we collected, where literally you can look at a wide swath of Israeli society. This was not cherry picked at all. And it's absolutely shocking, the responses and kind of the casual bl blase nature of people saying, bomb them all, kill them all drop a nuke on them, we need to expel them all. Um, and one guy that I talked to, literally the entire time I was there, I talked to one Israeli who said he was a leftist, and he said, that's a slur, by the way. And I said, well, what does it mean to be a leftist? And he said, it means that I want the occupation to be more humane. Um, and so I think that it's a stark reality, right? And this is, of course, not emblematic of the entirety of Israeli society, but just look at these protests. When you see bombing atrocities happening, when you see the where they go and invade the Muslim quarters of Jerusalem every year. I mean, there's just a handful of Israelis who are protesting these things every year, and there's just not enough of them to change the trend uh, of Israeli society, which is why they have called on us, why Palestinians have called on us, because the situation is becoming so urgent, because Gaza is uninhabitable now. They have called on the international community, on their brothers and sisters, on white allies, um, and Western allies to, to join BDS and, and join Palestinian solidarity movements and to push this issue forward to apply external pressure and mount that pressure from the international community. As, as um, the organizer of the Great March of Return said himself, that they are trying to do this to galvanize the international community in order to reach that moment, that historic moment that other peoples of the world have where they have achieved true liberation. And I think that that's why 
this issue is so important, why it's so important for us to get involved and push BDS forward. Great, thank you very much. And I hope um, folks know, uh, I'm pretty sure what BDS, Boycott Divestment Sanctions, if you look for BDS movement online, um, there's links there to what you can do or what you can find out about. Um, there's a specific question about BDS I want to get to in a min minute, but since you mentioned the Mavi Marmara attack in 2010, that's really the origin of the Canadian Boat to Gaza. There were a few Canadians on board at that time as well, uh, when nine uh, peace activists were killed, a tenth died later as a result of that attack, a whole bunch more were wounded. That was the origin of our campaign. People started saying to us, when is there going to be a Canadian boat? And uh, coming up for the 10th anniversary, uh, sad anniversary of commemoration in, in uh, the month of May this year, uh, and I know our Turkish friends with uh, Humanitarian Foundation there, he uh, who sponsored that boat, part of a larger flotilla, uh, are still in court. They're still pressing wow. the, the, the It's been turned back twice by the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, and the appeals panel keeps bouncing it back to them, and the lawyers keep taking it back. They're now represented the flag state, which is Comoros Islands, um, but they're persisting in seeking justice for those families, because all of the family members say this is not about justice just for our dead, our murdered loved ones. It's about justice for Palestine and justice for Gaza. And that's the origin of our movement. A great film we hope to bring to you later, but everybody can look for online, The Truth Lost at Sea, a Canadian Palestinian who was on board, made a film uh, about his experience and about what you said, about how the mainstream media narrative got twisted afterwards. And we lost the truth about what happened on the Mavi Marmara and the other boats in the flotilla. So that's another film that people can look for. We'll be hoping to bring you more about that with Rifat um, Ode another time. Um, this is our first experience, but probably not our last experience in these kind of online events. So questions folks are asking, um, some specifics about the film, uh, whether it's availability in other languages and so forth. Uh, we already talked about how you got the footage. Um, about uh, Rezan's family uh, in Gaza and how we can send them support. We'd love to hear about that later. Specifically about the injuries that are there. Uh, uh, again, you made a very clear point about the type of injuries, the people that are injured and the type of munitions are illegal in international law. Uh, has the, that toxic gas been identified and, and uh, the, the bone injuries? I know uh, Médecins Sans Frontières reported about the difficulty of treating those injuries because it was uh, the inability to get um, the proper antibiotics, effective antibiotics to treat them. Have you any word about any of that? Sure, so uh, the film is available in Arabic right now. You can go to gazafightsforfreedom.com. You can get DVDs there and also watch and rent the film, download it in Arabic and Spanish. We're actually putting it up in Spanish either today or tomorrow. So please spread that around. Um, we also have it uh, coming out in French, Turkish and Polish. We hope to put it in Chinese as well soon. So just kind of slowly but surely, and this is all volunteers who are just really passionate about the issue, moving forward with providing those translations, which I couldn't um, thank those people enough. And I think it's really important to just get this out there to as many people as we can. As far as the injuries, um, yeah, I mean, this is why we kind of structured it around the Geneva Conventions because already, you know, already as we made clear in the film it's already war crimes what they're doing i mean the usage of international i'm sorry the uses the use of exploding bullets um the targeting of disabled children press and medics i mean it's it just it's war crime on top of war crime just in the most egregious fashion possible and we really wanted to, to hammer that point home the injuries speak for themselves every single person that we talked to was shot with an exploding bullet uh, they're lucky to be alive because, as we know, it's very, very hard to get treated for that. Uh, several people we've talked to had to get their um, legs amputated, um, could not travel, did not get medical permits. And so, as we know, this has been a policy from Israeli authorities for quite some time, right? Forcibly breaking something that is documented very widely. And so it's not too surprising that they have targeted the limbs, uh, kind of tried to force these amputations if they didn't feel like just directly assassinating um, political activists. But yeah, absolutely targeting people in the joints, the knees, the arms, uh, it's absolutely criminal. Um, the, the tear gas, which is a misnomer, as we said, this unidentified toxic gas, I actually uh, saw a documentary by the BBC. This was produced by an Israeli. It was, it was horrifying. It was called One Day in Gaza. You don't want to watch it. It's, it treats Palestinians like animals. 
you know, you, you juxtapose our film with that film and it just is so clear how the media can twist the narrative and really paint a completely opposite picture of what's going on. It puts Palestinians in this dark room, you know, where, whereas our film just shows them in the light. I mean, something that's so simple and it makes you think of these people as so sinister and, and cynical. And what that film showed that ours did not was the toxic gas was actually much more intense um, than, than our footage was able to show. I mean, this is people having severe hallucinations, completely not knowing who they were, where they were. That, I don't know what that gas is. And, and I think that we know that Israel is a huge weapons contractor, weapons developer. One of the big, biggest facets of that quote unquote aid deal with the Obama administration was actually to try to buy U.S. weaponry back because Israel was posing a threat to the U.S. military industrial complex. We know that they have these weapons expos around the world where they tout and boast that their weapons are battle tested. Right. So tested on the cage population of Gaza. And so I think that this gas is an experimental gas. I don't know if it was multiple types of gas, but we know that um, they probably used it to, to try to sell to other countries. And, and, you know, they were excited about the effects that it had on people. Um, we know that one person suffocated from the gas. But we also know that it just made people lose consciousness over and over and over again and have these hallucinations that is not what normal tear gas does. So we do know that it was not tear gas and no one has really been able to finally um, determine what that comprised of. And I just hope that that can be exposed inevitably as just another war crime, you know, because we're, we're told all the time they use chemical weapons against their people. When we're talking about Assad or, you know, all these other countries, well, Israel is doing that as well. You know, we already know. <laughs> On America's time, right? The- right? Oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, it's it's directly subsidized for, and as you say, cynically marketed as battle tested on right. by Palestinians. Um, just one more question on BDS. People are asking beyond the personal boycott level. Uh, we recently had a, a, a victory where um, uh, Microsoft agreed to pull out of the the, the vision software, facial recognition software that's used to uh, lock down. Um, deny Palestinians freedom of movement in the West Bank at all the checkpoints there. Of course, freedom of movement is even more locked down for Palestinians in Gaza, but it's one of the many repressive technologies which is funded by any international mutual fund that's that's investing in, in Microsoft until recently was also funding that uh, repressive technology. So could you speak a little bit more beyond the personal level, right? The, the D and the S, right? How do we get to divestment by from corporations beyond the personal boycott, which is important, divestment by corporations and sanctions by states? Because that's what was really divisive, decisive, sorry, in the case of BDS against South Africa. I mean, it's a good question, and I think that we're still kind of at the um, preliminary stages of galvanizing those movements in order to get to step two and three. I think people first, it's a massive political education campaign and political awareness that Israel needs to be boycotted. I think in a lot of Western countries, people are still under the impression that Israel is a democracy um, and that this, you know, criminal medieval siege needs to be in place and the occupation just needs to be perpetual. So that's the first and foremost step, right? And I think that people, of course, watching this our understanding of that. Um, I think that beyond the personal boycott divestment sanctions movement um, that you can take on a, on a personal level, and of course that means downloading the boycott app on your smartphone, um, getting to know the brands very well that are personally investing in the criminal occupation. The UN just released their list, I think, of a couple dozen, maybe even a hundred uh, companies that were that were profiting off of the illegal settlement process, and so please get get comfortable with those names, get versed in that information, spread that awareness. Um, in terms of the divestment and sanctions aspect, I mean the sanctions aspect needs to come from the governments themselves, right? And we're dealing with a criminal enterprise, you know, the U.S. empire, <laughs> a rogue state that will continue to veto. Um, and assert its veto power at the UN Security Council, no matter what propositions are proposed. We saw, even in the film, Nikki Haley being represented, you know, representing the US, basically saying Hamas is happy with this. I mean, the entire rest of the world said, this is outrageous. We want to condemn Israel for this massacre. But as long as the US is asserting veto power, we're never going to get movement on that front. And so that's why I encourage the U.S. as well as its ally, Canada, I know that Trudeau is, is <laughs> I know that they have a really bad position on Israel as well. 
they need to be pressured. That's why the anti-war movement in these countries is so crucial. I mean, we need to resurrect an actual anti-war movement to be calling out um, this, this undying support for this criminal rogue state. I mean, for apartheid, let, let's be honest. And unless we mount those movements in our own countries and our respective countries, and unless we force our politicians to do the right thing, and, and I have faith in that because I see, I learned from the past. I mean, we can, we can attest that history has shown us that mass civil disobedience and mass grassroots movements of anti-war activists can and, and actually has been the only thing that has ever affected change. Um, and that's what we need to do to mount this pressure in order to sanction Israel and hold it accountable for its uh, human rights abuses. I mean, the fact that Bernie Sanders, and he has a lot of faults, he's a Zionist, he is an imperialist, but I do think the fact that he was even addressing withdrawing settlements to the 1967 borders, ending the criminal occupation of the West Bank, humanizing Palestinians in Gaza, I think that that, again, is a testament to how much the movement has already succeeded on the ground. This grassroots pressure that has mounted, that has pressured these politicians, that has enlightened people like Bernie Sanders and the millions of people behind him. Uh, and that that's something that we should not take for granted. And that's something that we should be optimistic about moving forward. Because back during the Iraq war 15 years ago, if you were to bring up a free Palestine, and this happened, you were told this is too divisive. This has nothing to do with the liberation of Iraq. This has nothing to do with the, the war in Iraq. And now, like I said before, you cannot call yourself an anti-war activist. You cannot call yourself a progressive or a socialist unless you do uh, support the liberation of Palestine, unless you are a BDS activist. And what does that show you? That shows you how much this movement has succeeded already. Um, as far as the divestment issue, we already know how terrified Israel is of divestment campaigns. That's why these legislations are being pushed so rapidly across Canada, across the US. And that is why it's so important to get involved in the divestment movements on college campuses specifically. That's what they're most scared of. But really any Palestine solidarity organization who is uh, implementing a divestment campaign needs to be supported, needs to be funded, um, and needs to be expanded. So I encourage everyone to get enlightened about those, those uh, campaigns in your area and see how you can get involved in them. Because yeah, one person boycotting Sabra Hummus at the store is not gonna really take us that far, but that's why we need to get involved, get out of your comfort zone and, and, and show up show up whenever there's another uh, bombing massacre in Gaza. I mean, we need to show solidarity on the streets and we can use the BDS movement as a reason to expose these issues even more. Let's say, you know, protesting these corporations, starting, starting an action outside of uh, Airbnb headquarters, you know, things like that. We can use it just as symbolic actions as well to just galvanize press and generate uh, that collective unity within our community. Okay. We're gonna go bring in somebody else in a minute and we'll have more of a back and forth at that point. Um, a, there's a ton more question there, I can't get to them all. Um, other people suggesting other translations, so they wanna know if it can be translated into Hebrew uh, or Bahasa Malaysia. Uh, we have a, a flotilla partner in Malaysia and they speak to that whole region where there's a lot of support for Palestine. I think they need to see the film as well. Some folks got up in the middle of the night. We've got viewers here from uh, Australia and the Pacific who got up for this event. I think we could probably uh, stream again at a more Pacific friendly time and maybe catch some more viewers on the other side of the world. But we have got people here from the Pacific, from South Africa, from Europe, from all over Turtle Island, uh, as well as elsewhere in this hemisphere. So it's really a very international uh, viewers. A few people have had problems with their internet and so they screened the, they could see the film, but this part is freezing up. Everything except the film will be archived and on YouTube. So stay, stay with us. We do have that part. The question and answer will be available elsewhere. Um, you mentioned pressuring our own co uh, country. So I will say, yeah, it's, we always say the flotilla is a platform in the Eastern Mediterranean, a small number of small boats that are floating platforms to allow us to address our own governments because the, the blockade of Gaza is gonna be broken in Ottawa and Washington and Brussels and Westminster and the capitals of all the countries that are complicit and support the blockade. That's my own experience. It wasn't about me getting captured at sea and being briefly de you know, detained for a week and then uh, uh, deported back to Canada. It was the opportunity that gave me to speak to Canadians who I never would have met otherwise and talk about the flotilla and our work. And that's what we continue to do. Uh, this, you know, 10 years later, we're still sailing. We have plans to keep sailing. Um, about uh, against the blockade in our own countries, because the blockade really is 
uh, there because our countries are complicit with it. Later this month, on the anniversary of um, the Great March, which is also the anniversary of, of the Land Day, I always laugh when the Americans say, oh, they planned it to coincide with our amnesty. You know, it's been <laughs> land, day, land Day for a long time, the 30th of March. There's a, there's a planned action that people can get involved with calling for uh, accountability from the Canadian government. And there's probably similar actions in your other countries. So watch for that. There will be an online campaign demanding minimal sanctions, a little bit of accountability from our own governments at the time of land day in cooperation with Al Haq, a human rights organization in, uh, in uh, Palestine. Um, so we had don't, we're going to go in a moment to Riot Shack Shack. I just wanted to mention that we are coming to you as part of uh, Canadian Botegaza, part of the Freedom Flotilla. Uh, and if one of my colleagues will post the link, uh, we've got a link to the latest update from the Freedom Flotilla, which is that obviously we're not sailing now. We plan to sail in May because it's the commemoration of 10 years of the, the attack on the flotilla in 2010, when 10 people ended up dead as a result of uh, aggressive, a murderous action by the Israeli Occupation Forces Navy against the Mavi Marmara. Other people were injured. That commemoration will go forward, but we're not able to travel to be there uh, in all of those ports. I mean, look at where Italy is now. Those are the ports we typically leave from. We can't obviously travel there to do that in the month of May. So we are postponing the flotilla. We do have a boat. We will sail later. Uh, and meantime, we're calling on people to please support the Palestinians of Gaza in your own countries. Um, uh, support uh, UN, the UNRWA, the uh, aid agency that is has been there for uh, for decades to support Palestinians with their urgent COVID nineteen um, uh, call for for donations to support them. We know that our governments haven't been supporting UNRWA the way they should, and we need to, as individuals and as organizations, step up and uh, support this and demand, for quite frankly, better humanitarian support. Because uh, well, we hear in a minute from Ryan, the, the perspectives are pretty grim, uh, always for healthcare in Gaza, but particularly in the context of, of the blockade and um, uh, and the uh, COVID-19. Just as a reminder, um, we are going to bring in uh, Riot in a minute. I wanted to mention Riot is a social outreach or outreach coordinator with We Are Not Numbers, one of the flotilla's partners in Gaza. Um, uh, and he's written about, we have uh, his articles uh, about the arrival of COVID-19 in, in Gaza. We Are Not Numbers is a group of inspiring, aspiring young journalists in Gaza, people who do amazing writing, but also video and other reports from the street. They've uh, commuted, uh, we've commissioned a couple, here's right now, a couple of videos from them. Uh, we can share those links as well. A video uh, a few years ago about fishers in Gaza called Six Miles Out, an award-winning uh, video produced in, in Gaza by uh, We Are Not Numbers. And very recently last year, um, <clears throat> dreams in the crosshairs about a young Palestinian athlete who was among those uh, who had his dreams cut short uh, by uh, that murderous, uh, those murderous sniper snipers on the, on the border. So that's a, a video to watch for. We'll share those links. But I'm happy to welcome uh, Riot Shakshak now of We Are Not Numbers in Gaza. And um, just ask your reaction to the film. It's the first time seeing it for me. And like many people, I was, I was blown away by the film. What was your, your impression, Riot? Well, hello, David. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thanks. You've got the okay, thanks for having well. me. Abby. Okay, uh, basically I was uh, fascinated about the film. Uh, it honestly covers so many aspects that the media never covers. Uh, it tells human stories uh, from Gaza. Uh, we're talking about personal stories. When we're not talking about like news, political news that is uh, in TV or on the internet. We're talking about human stories. And that's basically what we do in We Are Not Numbers. Um, if I may, I would like to tell you a little bit about We Are Not Numbers for those who never heard of us. Uh, so I am their outreach coordinator. Uh, we Are Not Numbers is a group of young people from the Gaza Strip. We've got about 50 people here, uh, writers and poem, poets, uh, and they're writing and making videos, stories told and heard. And um, if you want to learn more about We Are Not Numbers, you can go to wearenotnumbers.org. Uh, basically, We Are Not Numbers was founded in 2015. Uh, by Pam Bailey and uh, Ahmad Naouk. Uh, let me tell you the story of how When Numbers was founded. Uh, well, when Numbers was founded when Ahmad's brother was, you know, killed in the war on Gaza in 2014. Uh, Ahmad was a, an English student back then, and uh, he was talking to Pam Bailey, uh, who, by the way, proposed to 
do you know to have his brother's story written uh, so that the world can learn more about Gaza and about what's going on in Gaza. Uh, we know the the media doesn't cover Gaza and its actions very accurately or sometimes even fairly. So that was the start of Fiona Numbers. Uh, years by here we are, five years later, uh, we're turning from a project to an NGO here in Gaza. Uh, we're having an impact, not only locally, but globally. And uh, our impact, thank God, uh, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger through time. Uh, right now, we're recruiting new writers. Uh, you know, most of them are college students, and uh, we're giving them trainings uh, to become writers, you know, young journalists from Gaza, so that they would be able to use their keyboards, to use their smartphones, to capture, to write, to be heard. And uh, it is fascinating that all these people around the world read our stories. Uh, so speaking of these people, when they read our stories, they, they would learn so much about Gaza throughout our stories. And uh, we use storytelling as the major method. You know, we make videos, but when we make those videos, they're not like extremely you know, professional videos like they appear on TV. We make these videos very personal. We've got to keep it personal. That's what makes us very special. We are not numbers. Um, right now, uh, well, let me mention this as well. Uh, we are not numbers is a project that funds itself annually. Uh, every year we have uh, this fundraising campaign and uh, we have it in Ramadan so that as many people as possible would donate to our project so that it lasts for another year. Uh, for those people who would like to, you know, support us and uh, help us stay, you know, keep going for another year, uh, you can help us uh, this Ramadan. Stay tuned for our fundraising campaign. Uh, for any Palestinian who's very passionate about writing, about storytelling, about, you know, developing their skills as citizen journalists, they can go to weonetnumbers.org or they can contact us on our Facebook Twitter and Instagram accounts to ask questions. Uh, you've got till the end of the month and uh, you can apply, you can become a writer uh, for We Are Not Numbers. So uh, that's basically what we do in We Are Not Numbers. Um, I'm a storyteller, uh, I believe in storytelling. Uh, when I first joined uh, We Are Not Numbers, uh, my goal was to tell stories that no one would even think of about Gaza. Whenever people think about Gaza, what did they think of? They think of war, they think of destruction, demolition, and they think of, you know, uh, war airplanes just lying over Gaza and pumping Gaza, so Gazans getting injured, Gazans getting killed, and uh, we've got the Great Chen March, of course, that's huge. And uh, Right, that's we're gonna have time, we're, right, we're gonna have time, and I wanna hear more about this, but Abby has to go soon, so I was wondering if you could comment specifically about the film or ask, uh, Abby, anything about the film before she has to go. And we'll get back in the last part of the, the talk to uh, your story about We Are Not Numbers. Thank you. Right. Uh, uh, first, I would like to thank you for the film. It's really awesome. It covers, as I said, uh, personal stories. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you take these stories from behind the wall, you know, from the dark. And I'm very happy that it's translated to English so that the whole world would, uh, you know, listen to it. Uh, I've got no, you know, uh, comments on it except that. Uh, thank you so much for your hard work and thank you for the movie uh, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> so you were talking to us about the types of stories that you tell in uh, in Gaza. Are any uh, final thoughts? Well, we'll get back to that in a minute. But the types of stories that we are not numbers tell in Gaza, from Gaza to the world. Yeah. Uh, so basically, our tra our writers are trained to to go out to interview people, uh, to take their answers, their words and uh, turn them into beautiful stories. Uh, and then we publish that on our website and our platforms. And uh, I, I think people here in Gaza are very happy that some people care about them. Uh, they get very excited when we go there holding, you know, simple tools like smartphones or sometimes a camera and uh, take pictures of what they want to show the world. And uh, they, they, they talk a lot, you know they get so happy that they get heard, that they talk a lot. They, they, <laughs> they mention so many details. And uh, they're happy that those details are going to be spread out, you know, out there in English. And they get extremely happy that when foreign people, you know, read them and, uh, you know, sometimes they connect to these people. Sometimes they contact them because um, in some cases, uh, some people, are, um, you know, they have like, serious struggles we're talking about uh, some people who cannot travel we're talking about some people who need you know surgeries or drugs or any kind of you know medical treatment 
So uh, uh, throughout Reinet numbers, this happened a lot. Or some people actually need, you know, uh, financial uh, help to, to get up, you know, to get on their feet and uh, to start their lives. So, so many people abroad uh, actually contacted us to, you know, to get out to these people uh, to help them out. And that happened a lot. So that's why uh, our message is very important and it gives hope to all Gazans here, uh, you know, to, to have a better life, you know, to have, you know, an opportunity. That's, that's very huge because so many people here don't even get an opportunity for that. So uh, um, we don't always, uh, or we don't only use one method, as I said, uh, those videos, they have a bigger impact on people here in abroad. Um, Gaza is very different from the inside. It's not like the Gaza on the news. And uh, of course, we use prose as well. We use poetry. So um, yeah, th that's our method, storytelling. That's great. And again, as a reminder, you can find these. We've uh, shared the link with you for weirdnotnumbers.org. You can find their stories, their words, their written words, as well as links to their videos there. Some of them have been shared by freedomflotilla.org. Um, look at our new website there, our recent statement about delaying this year's fl uh, flotilla. Um, we're happy to work with partners. Part of our role is not to bring you our messages, but to bring you their messages, because one of the beauties of the internet and uh, social media is that we can get around the media blockade. There's a physical blockade, there's a brutal military blockade of Gaza, but there's also an information blockade. And we need to do things like this, get Abby's film to people, get Riot and his colleagues' stories to people. Uh, and if we can be a conduit about, uh, to help with that. I, I, I was... Uh, mobilized around this issue initially in 2008-9 with cast lead and I think one of the big differences we're seeing now is the number of eloquent Palestinian voices that are getting out so we don't have to only rely on the lies we hear from the mainstream media we can hear Palestinian voices we can hear voices of courageous uh, amazing journalists like Abby. Um, Abby I know you have to go soon any final thoughts about this uh, this process or about the film or about what's going on? Well, I really appreciate what Riot is doing. Um, we Are Not Numbers is an incredible organization that I really encourage everyone to donate to, to support, because it's really important. Um, and as my, Gaz my colleagues in Gaza have told me too, I mean, it's really tough to be defined by just death, war, and violence. And one thing that they wanted to make clear is that they wanted to tell Western audiences, can you please tell Americans that we don't want to die? that we love life and we want to live and we want to show the beauty in Gaza and we want to show how uh, we love, you know, we, we love our families and, and all of this. And it's really sad that Gaza is so, um, it's such in such a dire state that sometimes we forget to, to highlight uh, that part of it, right? The poetry, the music. Yeah. Uh, the love, uh, the the religion, the community, um, the food, right? <laughs> the amazing Palestinian food. Exactly. And so it's really, <laughs> which I miss a lot. <laughs> um, but that's something that's so, so crucial. And I thank you so much, right, for doing that and for making that the crux of your project. And, you know, if there's one thing that I can just leave you with, and it's really that Palestinians have taught me what courage really is. And that's what we saw from Razan and her colleagues terrified right they were terrified to go to the border she said to her colleague rasha she said do we have to go to the fence today i don't want to go to the fence today but they did anyway and that's what courage is courage is not being fearless courage is being scared and doing it anyway and that's what palestinians have showed me and that's what we all need to live up to and to fight as hard as we can in our communities in our spaces to show them that we stand in solidarity with them and we will do everything that we can uh, to fight for their liberation and to fight against our government supporting this criminal apartheid state. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you for watching the film. Thank you, Riot. Thank you, David. Uh, much love. Stay safe. Uh, our hearts are with you. Thank you, Abby. Thank you very much. Abby, thank you for your work. Uh, and a couple of people are asking about how can we encourage everyday people to understand this humanitarian, humanitarian catastrophe? How can we reach out to family members and others who have preconceived ideas about all of this as, as propaganda? I think um, I'd love to hear about your ways of reaching them briefly before, before you go or after you go from riot. 
So how do we reach the wider audiences? I would just say right now, the Trump administration is a perfect um, avenue for us to open that dialogue for people who think that they're progressive, who, I mean, it's kind of hard to convince racists, right? So, so maybe we should forget about those people, but the people who want to do good, who are just confused about the incessant media propaganda, I think Trump's fascist allegiance and alliance with Netanyahu is something that we can use to say, why does the Trump administration, why are they so staunchly aligned with Netanyahu? What is it about Netanyahu and about this government that is so attractive to white nationalists and white supremacists in the U.S. and essentially neo-Nazis? Um, and that's something that really needs to be explored. And I think it can open the dialogue to family members who maybe are closed off to this issue, and especially the Great March of Return, you know, something that everyone can relate to, mass mobilizations of peaceful Palestinians from all stripes of life, um, doing this and getting mowed down uh, for no reason, and and the atrocious actions of the Israeli military that were targeting protected categories of the Geneva Conventions. People don't know this. They have no idea what's going on, especially with COVID-19, the lack of electricity, the lack of medical um, supplies. This is something that I think is another avenue that while we're in this global pandemic and we're all in this together, bringing Gaza to light and, and bringing it into the conversations as you kind of have a captive family audience <laughs> as you're calling and FaceTiming with while we're all isolated and quarantined in our home, please bring up Gaza, please bring up the situation, uh, bring it into every single discussion that you have, because again, it comes from grassroots uh, information and dissemination of, of our thoughts and ideas to get around that information blockade. Absolutely, thank you very much. Brian, your thoughts? Well, I think you this time is a bit Just a second. Do you have, you, I think. Oh, it's, a, it's okay. I can, I, I want to hear what Ryan has to say. I'm going to remind folks, go to GazaFightsForFreedom.com. Thank uh, you. For that film, you're all going to want your own copy because the internet isn't a reliable thing these days. So, and because there's too many of us on it. So you're going to want your own copy. Grab uh, Abby's film to share uh, with your immediate uh, family, the folks around you. Um, but also let people know about it and more translations coming soon, which is awesome. And it's going to reach a wider audience. Um, oh, and we have a discount code 50% off for rentals and, and purchases worth the quarantine. So I, you can check that out on our social media to get that information. And, and I want to hear what Ryde has to say, and then I'll log off. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I think basically this is the best time ever to, to talk about Gaza. We're talking about quarantine. We're not talking about one country, two countries, three countries. No, we're talking about the whole world. Uh, as you know, Gaza has been under blockade for nearly 14 years. That's a long time. Uh, for me, I lived my entire life here in Gaza. Uh, I went out, you know, for just one semester to the United States of America, and I feel like what it is like to be a human being, uh, what it is like to, to have human rights, to have freedom. And I need to focus on freedom because that's what we don't have here, freedom. So uh, I think if the board needs to, to, to talk about Gaza, to remember Gaza, to support Gaza, stand with Gaza and do everything that's right to do. Uh, this is not only about Gaza, this is about supporting humanity. We're talking about human people here. We're talking about over 2 million people here in Gaza. So uh, I think right now, as so many people around the world, most people around the world are sitting at their homes and they've got basically nothing to do. So I think right now it's important for them to reach out to, to think of other people. People like right, right here in Gaza, sitting in darkness. I've got no power. We've got power crisis. Uh, all I've got is this little light right here in front of me so that you people can hear me. I, and I'm using batteries, just like most you know, houses here in Gaza. I'm, I'm using batteries <clears throat> so that I can turn on my Wi-Fi so that I can you know, use my phone so, so that all of you can hear me and see me right now. Uh, I think quarantine is the best opportunity for Gaza to be heard. Uh, we don't have only just the COVID-19 uh, the COVID-19 virus here. We've got so many problems. Uh, it would take me forever to talk about that. Uh, starting with power crisis, we're talking about water pollution, we're talking about the Great Return March and its events, we're talking about so many people who've got injured and killed, we're talking about, you know, so even power, uh, I'm talking about, uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about internet crisis recently here in Gaza because of the recent events. Uh, we're talking about poverty, we're talking about people having to go out. They've got no, no choice to stay indoors, they have to go out to be exposed to exposed to COVID-19 because they gotta work, they gotta earn a living because the day they don't work out, uh, will go out to work, they don't make money and they've got kids to feed. So you've got to think about all of that. Gazans have got no savings, no money, no food, nothing. So um, 
at this time of the year, uh, it's really tough. And uh, it's really, really, really hard for Gazans to take anything, you know, more. You know, the pressure is extremely, you know, like, you know, it's, it's uneven. It's, it's ultimate, you know, you can't even describe it. So you can imagine, like, it's more pressure right now on Gazans. So um, quarantine, people, quarantine. That, that's the answer. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye. y'all. Much love, solidarity Bye. with everyone. Bye, Ride. Stay safe. Bye. Thank, Bye. Thank you. You too. Uh, and we've just shared with you again the link for um, where to download the film. Um, and again, video quality or streaming quality is going to be uh, chancy or iffy these days. So consider downloading your own copy. Um, and when we can, we'll grab some information about the quarantine special discounts that they've been offering. Um, Ride, you've written recently uh, uh, for We Are Not Numbers about the arrival of COVID-19. Um, I'd love exactly. to share that now uh, with, our, with our viewers. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the events of the last, last week for you? Okay, uh, well, Gaza has turned up, uh, you know, upside down in one night. Uh, I think COVID-19 has spread around the world, but because we've got a blockade, you know, we, we knew this blockade is going to, you know, prevent any possible chance of COVID-19 to get into Gaza. So uh, the disease has spread around the, the world. It hasn't got to Gaza. It was the first week, the second week, the third week. So I think we, the Palestinians here in Gaza, got to a mental state, and we actually started to be convinced that we're never going to have to deal with that because of the blockade. And uh, that actually got so many people to actually breeze the blockade. Can you imagine that? This blockade, the same blockade that prevented so many people from traveling, you know, for either uh, to study, for either to, to get medicine, for either for any purpose or to work. So like this blockade was the reason so many people lost their jobs, their opportunities, their scholarships, or even, you know, uh, medical treatment. So many people died because of this blockage. But recently, because of the events, uh, COVID-19, uh, some people actually started to praise that. I personally was against that because uh, that actually never justifies, you know, having a blockage here on Gaza. So um, at one night, uh, we've got some passengers into Gaza. Two of them were coming back from Pakistan. And uh, these people have got, they were infected. They, they've got coronavirus. And um, well, when the, when the government here announced that they've got, you know, they're, they're infected, uh, the, the Gaza Strip freaked out in one night. I was one of those people and uh, I, I couldn't actually sleep that night because I knew something up, something big is coming. And uh, we, we need to be careful. This is no joke. And, and I think most people here weren't actually very serious about this, but right now there are. Uh, so what happened basically that night, um, I, I couldn't sleep. And to me, uh, as a writer, as a storyteller, I feel like I need to express myself. I need, uh, you know, I, I have this power inside of me. I, I, I'm stressed, you know, and I need to unleash all of that. So my, my perfect way of doing that is writing. Uh, and even though so many people wrote about coronavirus uh, a bit before uh, the two infections were declared here in Gaza, I never feel like uh, the need to actually write about coronavirus. So many people did that, so what, right? You're not gonna add anything to that. But I got to a point where I was very stressed. For me, it was time to actually write about it. And I wrote my story, uh, it was a personal story. Um, basically, I sit up that night because I couldn't sleep and I needed to tell my father to not to go out to the most because it's not safe there anymore. Uh, even though I'm, I w I'm not aware of the, the situation outside in my neighborhood, I'm not, I'm not even aware if we got coronavirus or not. So uh, that's how it started. Uh, the next day, so many people here in Gaza started to go out. They would go to markets, they would go to, to, to the malls, and they would buy stuff. And uh, those people who can, by the way, this is not everyone. We're talking about those people who've got savings. Uh, they went out, they bought food, they bought you know groceries, whatever they need. Uh, we're talking about hand sanitizers, we're talking about masks, uh, gloves, uh, anything they can buy, anything that's available, and they would just stuck all of that in their homes so that they don't have to go out and buy those uh, things uh, for a long time. And uh, I think uh, the, the Gaza Strip, you know, started to, to realize how serious this is, that every day, less and less people would go out, and every day people are... Um, you know, more aware of this coronavirus and, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, side effects and what it can do. And, you know, personally in my neighborhood, what 
you know, got our people, my neighborhood, extremely serious, uh, is that the hotel that's actually across my building, you know, it's just a few meters away from me. I can see it from my window. It's my view, actually. Uh, it's a hotel. Uh, the government here turned it into a quarantine uh, because basically we don't have enough hospitals in Gaza. We don't have enough uh, medical uh, equipment or tools or even test kits or whatever. So uh, I think uh, the night that I was coming back from work to my neighborhood and uh, I was seeing these ambulance cars, you know, ambulance cars, they were there and my neighborhood was really loud. You know, it's a very calm neighborhood. It was so loud that night and they were coming and they were getting about 80 people into that jail. I think that's what everyone here realized how serious the situation here. Right. Yeah, that, that really brings it home. Um, you've talked about in your in the piece. We just shared a, a link to your your piece on um, on we are not numbers about the uh, the effects on people earning a living, for example, which is you know yeah. many people in many places are faced with this this decision to stay home to slow the spread of the of the disease. But of course, if you have to go out during your living, that 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 decision isn't equal in in it's not equal in our communities and it's not equal around the world. Um, and we know that Gaza in particular is vulnerable because of the, the lack of medical infrastructure, the lack of supplies and all of that. But we'd like to do you to talk about the story that's covered in the film. Uh, it's been going on for, well, uh, coming up for two years in, at the end of the month. How will this affect the protests of the Great March of Return? And in general, how will it affect the mobilization of, of uh, resistance in Palestine? Well, with coronavirus here in Gaza, you don't expect people to gather. I mean, that's how coronavirus spreads around. So uh, I think uh, people will, will not be able to go to the, pro to the protests on the borders to express uh, their anger uh, and uh, their frustration with the occupation, with the blockage here on Gaza. Uh, you know, on Monday, the day after tomorrow, it actually marks the third uh, anniversary of the Great Return March. It is also, as you said, it's land day. Uh, it's the Palestinian land day. It's very important to us. We're talking about Palestine here, our country, you know. And for me, as a Palestinian, uh, we believe that this, this country and this land actually belongs to us. And every year, people would go out and they would express uh, the disappointment in everyone, in every, you know, in everything that actually disappointed us. Uh, we're talking about the UN, we're talking about the refugees, you know, we are refugees, but we never have the right of return. Israel uh, is actually stopping us from returning. So I, I think uh, when you talk about those protests, I think safety comes first. So Palestinians in Gaza would not be able to go there to protest, to, to, to express themselves because they have got to stay indoors. Uh, that's for the protests. And when you talk about mobilization here in Gaza, um, I, I think my answer is very clear. Uh, people would not go out. They would only go out for emergencies. And uh, even the Gaza Strip, uh, it's been divided into three places, uh, three areas, because uh, the government here is also trying to get people to stay indoors. But at the same time, they may get to the spot is very important. Uh, if you talk about curfew, we cannot have a curfew here in Gaza. The government knows people cannot stay indoors. That's for so many people, uh, for so many people, for so many reasons. Uh, as I said, poverty, hunger, you know, people are going to starve to death. And I'm not kidding. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who live this way. If, it, if you want to see like houses here in Gaza apartments, uh, most of the time, they're very, you know, close, small, and uh, they're not even healthy. And that's, that's, that's very important. I was actually seeing videos of my foreign friends, you know, international friends from around the world. And they were talking about, uh, you know, quarantine. But when you see their houses, like they've got big houses, the sun can actually get into their houses, you know, we're talking about sunlight. Uh, and you talk about like these people, they've got like backyards and they've got like streets and, you know, they're not living in crowded camps like we do here in Gaza. That's the problem with camps. Refugee camps are not livable anymore. And uh, I think because of that, Gazans do not, they, they cannot even actually prepare to stay indoors for all the time. So mm -hmm. at some point, they're going to have to go out. So that's, that's getting serious. If one person here in Gaza gets inflicted and, uh, you know, the, the coronavirus is going to spread so fast, 
and uh, because we live here under blocked and uh, we don't have you know enough as I said hospitals or even PEDs you know um, it's gonna be a disaster you know this outbreak of coronavirus is gonna be extremely um, what I say well, what is the right word it's gonna be extremely dangerous mm -hmm. um, the, the reason that we don't have enough hospitals or enough uh, medical treatments or enough access uh, to, to anything that starts to me to talk about uh, biscuits, we're talking about uh, beds, we're, we're talking about even people uh, like doctors, like nurses. Uh, the reason because of that is uh, the, the Israeli occupation that actually bombed those hospitals uh, throughout the years. We're talking about the, the, the wars on Gaza. We've had three wars, uh, one in 2008, one in 2012, and one in 2014. During these wars, the hospitals here got bombed. In, in recent years, so many doctors think Gaza could not pair with the situation here, so that if you know eventually they had to immigrate from Gaza. So Gaza is out of doctors, Gaza is out of medical uh, machines, medical equipment, med medical tests, medical um, you know people. Uh, so that's yeah, th that's extremely dangerous. We're just going to go very briefly to a poll uh, that we have ready for you here, specifically about that, the, si the situation there and what people would be willing to do uh, to address the situation. Because as you say, the current crisis is in a part because of international conditions with the spread of COVID-19, but it's in part worse, in large part worse because of the blockade, because of the lack of access, because of the bombed infrastructure, medical facilities, uh, because of uh, the drain of uh, of professionals away from uh, Palestinian professionals away from Palestine in general and away from Gaza in particular, uh, so uh, all of those um, conditions make it uh, particularly difficult there. Uh, and while we still have lots of participants here, I'd like the poll to go out. I can't actually control it here, but I think there we go. Uh, people are asked what they're willing to do to uh, support Gaza now. Check all that reply and tell us. Uh, and as you leave, there will also be a, a post attendee uh, link to a, a survey. We'd love to stay in touch with all of you um, about our ongoing work with the flotilla. Uh, so we have um, that poll we'd love people to do now. Um, well, uh, Raid, you talk to us uh, a bit more about your work and how you see the future. What hope you see out there for, for any kind of change? Um, Abby talked to us about uh, beginning to see uh, change in the discourse in North America. Um, uh, have you seen any changes in the way people are talking or thinking about the occupation of Palestine? Well, actually, the occupation has been occupation since 1948, uh, since in Nakba. Uh, that was obvious in the film, uh, in Abby's film. So uh, I don't think people would ever uh, tolerate uh, living with this occupier. And as Abby said, this is a simple equation. This is a simple conflict. We've got an occupier, we've got an occupied. And this, this is never, this is never, you know, an equal side. Uh, wait, let me get back to you. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, so we've got an occupier and occupied. Uh, this is never, you know, equal. So I, I don't think people here would ever appreciate anything that the occupation is doing. Even if it tries, you know, to act in front of the media that they want to help Gaza if you want to help Gaza, first you take down the blockade. You know, your siege has been choking Gaza for 14 years. And as I said before, like it prevented so many people from opportunities to get medicine, to travel, to work, to, to study. So uh, if, if Israel actually wants to, to give Gazans a better life, like don't always blame it on, you know, a group of people here. And that's what Israel keeps doing. It always does that. So I think people here uh, need to live. They, they need to work to provide to their families. And I think because of the economic situation here in Gaza, it's very, very you know, dangerous, disastrous, actually. Uh, these people here in Gaza, right now, their first priority, number one priority, is to make money, to provide food. People here are hungry, you know. So many people have got so many dreams, but they cannot go anything near their dreams just because they live in Gaza, because of the Israeli occupation, because of the Israeli pocket. Uh, if you want to talk about my generation, my generation, you know, right now I graduated from college, you know. If you want to talk about people here in Gaza, we've got about, you know, 250,000 people, you know, college graduates who are jobless. What, what is the reason? You know, of that, I, I think the reason behind that is this pocket and this real occupation. So uh, I think uh, because we are the ones who live this, 
Well, we're talking about power crisis right here. I'm sitting here in Gaza. No one's telling me that Gaza has got power crisis. I'm living this on a daily basis. And the best case scenario is that we get eight, eight, eight uh, hours of electricity a day and uh, eight hours cut off. And that's not even, you know, always the case. They always cut it off for like nine, 10 hours and they get it for like six, seven hours. That's the best we can get. And by the way, like Gazans are very happy with that. The reason that they're very happy with that is that we live, you know, some days. Uh, I remember in that 2014 war, there were like three or four days, like we didn't get power, you know, not even for a second. You know, can, can you imagine that? And uh, I think uh, for during uh, all those hard times, Gazans here we would be able to get our, for, uh, you know, power for like, you know, two hours a day, four hours a day, max. So uh, I, I think it's very sad that Gazans are sitting down, you know, for, for just a few, you know, number of hours a day. Uh, th that's not even enough. So yeah, uh, but back to your question, I think uh, the occupation needs to go, the blockade needs to go. Uh, we're talking about like human rights here. We're not demanding too much. We, we only want to live and have some rights. We want to travel and we want to live, you know, a fair life, just like the rest of the world is. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. So uh, as you've indicated in the poll, many of you are uh, willing to support in one way or always uh, the blockade, the work against the blockade, um, whether it is a temporary uh, lifting, a more permanent lifting, or helping uh, by the various ways we can donate through medical aid for Palestine or through UNRWA to get aid in the hands of Palestinian organizations that need it. Um, we have one other question, but since you're, you talked about being on the ground and getting the truth out from the ground, uh, people are wondering if um, the reports in the last couple of days that it went from two to nine cases, have you heard anything else about more cases and the state of readiness uh, uh, among um, Palestinian uh, health authorities in Gaza? And we'll just say that we also have some links we will publish later, follow our Facebook pages uh, from um, the Red Crescent Society in, in Gaza, a longtime supporter uh, of uh, their work as well, um, Dr. Munal Farah, talking about how unprepared they are and under equipped they are. What's your. Yeah, uh, so can you repeat that? Your news about recent cases, we heard that it went from two to nine. Our uh, viewers are wondering if more than yeah, nine, yeah. Uh, and what is the state of readiness uh, among the health authorities? Well, basically, uh, as first reported, there were only two cases in Gaza. Those two people, they were coming back from Pakistan. And a few days later, uh, Gaza woke up to a very shocking news that uh, we've got another seven people got infected. Uh, those seven people are actually policemen. Uh, they were working at the border and uh, in quarantine. So uh, these people are also in quarantine right now. Uh, in Gaza, I've got statistics here, right here, uh, before I joined you. Uh, so basically, Gaza has got 339 tests, and uh, we've got 330 of them are negative. And that leaves us to only nine tests that are positive. So uh, I think so many people got into Gaza. Uh, we were talking about, about uh, 2,050 people, uh, 2,500 people, I'm sorry. And uh, right now, uh, what uh, the government is trying to do uh, is trying to prevent people from getting together in any possible way. Uh, we're talking about markets. We're talking about parties. We're talking about weddings. We're, we're talking about uh, mosques, when, when people go to mosques. So for the first time, actually, in our history, people were not able to perform uh, Salat al-Jum'ah, uh, al-Jum'ah prayer uh, this past Friday. So yeah, and uh, another thing that the, the government here is trying to do to spread uh, this uh, coronavirus from uh, spreading around, to prevent it actually uh, from spreading around, is uh, you, when you talk about quarantine, we've got so many people are quarantined right now, and uh, they're trying to extend the, the time that they're quarantined. Uh, first, they were like 14 years, uh, 14 days, I'm sorry. And uh, from two weeks now, they're making it three weeks. So that they're like 100% sure that these people who go out, they're like 100% positive, you know? Like, when I say positive, I mean like, you know, they don't have coronavirus, not like tested positive. Um, so uh, I think the markets right now, uh, the big markets in Gaza, they're really closed. 
and uh, all things are postponed, you know, till later, till after Ramadan to see where this is going. Uh, schools have actually been off for so many weeks right now. Colleges as well. Uh, we're, we're using, uh, you know, internet uh, for the first time actually in our history uh, to support the educational uh, career here in Gaza. Uh, we're talking about people using uh, webinars, we're using live chats, using uh, models for the first time ever. So all of that, uh, this coronavirus has making this huge impact. And I am one of those few people who are actually working from home right now. And uh, I'm really grateful that I've got a battery I can use to stay online, to do my work as the outreach coordinator for We Are Numbers. But at the same time, uh, I believe so many people uh, are struggling with that right now. I, I personally struggled with that in the past, but I, I had to fix that. So um, that's, that's the case for coronavirus right now. We've got nine people. Uh, so many tests uh, were had recently in Gaza. Uh, the government said uh, it will announce the results as soon as they, you know, pop up. And uh, the reason that it does that is because, as it said, uh, it wants to comfort people to stay like 100% honest with people because it doesn't want people to freak out or to, to have, you know, a mass here in the Gaza Strip. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that report from the ground. Uh, and as you say, I mean, here we talk about people working from paycheck to paycheck, people who won't be able to pay the rent on the 1st of uh, April and so forth to pay their bills uh, because they're out of work. Of course, the situation you describe often, people in Gaza are living day to day. If they don't work, they don't eat, their families don't eat. So it's a very, they feel the, the, the effects of the, of the lockdown, the quarantine on their homes very, very quickly. Um, yeah. We've published links there. Everybody can see the links to donate to We Are Not Numbers. Um, we'll post them again. Uh, you can also see them by following our social media. So the freedomflotilla.org, um, we are not numbers.org uh, for Ra'id story, but also the donate to work of uh, the amazing, aspiring, inspiring young journalists, uh, Palestinian journalists in Gaza like Ra'id, uh, their work supporting the written word, but also the videos. Um, following the Freedom Flotilla to know the news of our plans. Uh, what what's coming up? What we will be doing? Certainly, we'll be doing more online activism like this in the in the weeks, possibly months to come. Um, but also follow the news because we will be sharing with you the type of events that we've had over the last ten years uh, as we sail towards Gaza, um, as we uh, try to break, as we said, the information blockade and bring the story home about our government's um, uh, um, complicity with this. So. My organization, our organization in Canada, CanadianVoteGaza.org and internationally, FreedomFlotilla.org. We still have viewers from many, many different countries, so you don't have to find us. You find some support organization, Freedom Flotilla, in uh, many different countries has different uh, partners in Europe and the Pacific and South Africa and around the world. If not, find some solid organization that you're comfortable working with and help their work. Um, support the work of... Uh, of uh, We Are Not Numbers in, in Gaza, support the work of courageous independent journalists like Abby Martin to get their story out in the US and around the world. Um, follow us for updates, buy Abby's film, share Abby's film, get your organization, if you can't, get an organization to uh, buy uh, Abby's film and uh, screen it. If you can't screen it internationally like we're doing, screen it locally, stream it locally, uh, share it up with your family and friends. Uh, during this time, it's an important thing that we can keep doing is to share these messages. Um, so there will be, uh, uh, we will be publishing not the film, but all of the, the, the discussion, the question and answer since then. So if you missed part of, some people said part of Abby's uh, chat or uh, Raid's chat was uh, frozen up. We obviously can't control what happens with the internet for 100 or 200 people, but all of it will be archived, except for the film, will be archived in a, in a YouTube broadcast that we will make available to you. Uh, and um, yeah, we're just going to save uh, everything here um, so that uh, we can get in touch with everybody. Uh, please go to the after survey and let us know if you, we can get in touch with you uh, about our work uh, and we'll send out uh, more information about this when we're done. And we look forward to hearing more stories from Gaza from uh, We Are Not Numbers in the future. Thank you so much. Yeah. For Thank you, but, but before I go, let me just uh, give it one second to the Palestinian people here in Gaza. Uh, they deserve actually to be applauded uh, because, you know, as I said, so many people cannot go out right now, but we're having also this starvation issue. Uh, so I think that created some sort of, you know, um, you know, polit not political, but 
you know, people here are sending together, they're sending, you know, food and money. So many initiatives here locally in Gaza were started so that those people are going to starve because they don't have savings, money or food. They're going to get money and food for them to stay indoors and uh, to not starve so that everyone is one hand. And that's, that's really awesome. I'm so proud of the Palestinian people here in Gaza. Absolutely. And we applaud you. We applaud the courage of the people we saw in the film, but also the courage of We Are Not Numbers telling their story every day. So follow our stories, follow their stories, share them up if you can, donate if you, you know, share them up in any case and donate if you can to support their work. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for, for uh, being with us today. Watch for uh, more news from the Freedom Flotilla, from We Are Not Numbers, uh, and from the other organizations involved here. Thanks so much and uh, good afternoon. Stay safe, stay indoors, but stay in touch, stay engaged. Thanks so much. Thank you.